I consider it uh, a real privilege to talk about this topic this morning, which is the long-term implications of untreated tongue tie. Time and time again, we get the question, what if I don't do anything? What if I don't treat? Who here has heard this question from their parents, from their community members, from pediatricians? Who here is often frustrated after pointing out that there are problems, we need to intervene early, yet you're met with uh, defensive statements such as, where's the evidence and what happens if we don't do anything? Anyone ever deal with these questions in their communities? So today what we're going to be doing is taking a look at the research and evidence and in a way that helps us understand how we can intervene early, not only for tongue tie, but also other issues that affect the children and parents in our communities. And because I get this question so, so, so frequently, we're actually gonna be recording this and providing it as a link on YouTube so that you can share it with your patients and their parents so that they can really understand the latest updates as it applies to the research and evidence behind tongue tie and treatment. My name is Dr. Saroosh Zaghi. I'm a graduate of Harvard Medical School, UCLA ENT residency and Stanford Sleep Surgery Fellowship. And since fellowship, I'm honored to have become the medical director of the Breathe Institute, where we take a structural, functional, and behavioral approach to not only treating, but also preventing pediatric and adult sleep and breathing issues. And the real crux of our institute is the fact that we have to always continue learning. And it's in fact, this slide that was presented to me on the first day of medical school by the Dean of Harvard Medical School that inspired the rest of my career. On the first day, he put up this slide and said, half of what you'll learn in medical school will be shown to be either dead wrong or out of date within five years of your graduation. The trouble is that nobody can tell you which half. So the most important thing is to learn how to learn on your own. What an incredible message. What an incredible message to consider that we always have to continue learning. And it's with that energy and motivation that we built the Breathe Institute with our amazing clinical and research team who work hard behind the scenes to go out and learn from other amazing speakers, lecturers, and educators, and to develop new knowledge and protocols within the patients and uh, within our practice, as well as with our ambassadors and affiliates all throughout the country and the world. Today, we're gonna be taking a look at a very familiar concept of tongue tie. And perhaps everyone has heard about tongue tie in some capacity, but we're here to take um, perhaps a new, updated, fresh look at this very familiar problem. And to do that, I'd love to introduce you guys to my son, Maxim. Here's Maxim helping to contribute to the research at the Breathe Institute. Here he is uh, in my office. Uh, he's now two years old. Uh, it's been such a joy to watch him grow and develop. And it was just my birthday uh, last week. And I'd love to share this little moment with you. Amazing, amazing. Oh my gosh. So simple, but so beautiful. Just to watch my son be able to feed, to be able to breathe, to be able to speak, it really melts my heart. Because these are simple, simple things that we take for granted. And when things are going well, it's very simple. But when things are not going well, it's quite complex. Lucky for us, I am an ENT and tongue tie specialist. So when Maxim was born, the first thing I checked for 
before I could see the color of his eyes or count his fingers or his toes was whether or not he had a tongue tie. And in fact, indeed, Maxim was born with the physical tethering, a physical connection from the tongue to the floor of the mouth in such a way that it restricted the mobility of the tongue, affected his feeding, posture, breathing, and more. So we were really lucky to get him out of the hospital within the first two days and bring him to the Breathe Institute where we had the privilege of working with my colleague, Dr. Pinto, for his tongue tie release. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Honestly, God bless you. You don't know, of course. Oh, yeah, that's a tongue tie. You guys call Max first. You can call Max first. Gabby says I can. Okay, can you put your goggles on you? Yep, okay. Twelve seconds. Twelve seconds. That will change the trajectory of his life. And we notice immediate changes to for his ability to breastfeed, his posture, his tone, his overall sense of ease in the world. Here's Maxim at two days of life with that physical connection from the tongue to the floor of the mouth, that tongue tie, that connection, that restriction that's limiting his tongue mobility. And here he is at five days old, day three of healing with his tongue, not down, but up in the roof of the mouth. And by eight days old, his tongue easily and completely is able to elevate with ease for optimal function. So we consider what is a tongue tie? And again, a tongue tie is altered tongue mobility. The tongue can't lift, it can't move, it's limited in its mobility due to the presence of restrictive tissue connecting the tongue to the floor of the mouth. Now we consider why do you need to have good tongue mobility? Why should we be, need to move our tongue? Why don't we just hold our tongue still at the bottom of the mouth? And clearly, you need to be able to lift the tongue to produce those speech sounds, T, L, N, D sounds with the front of the tongue, R, S, K, G sounds with the back of the tongue. And you think to yourself, do you think that Maxim could sing happy birthday to me with such fluency if he had to fight and pull against the floor of the mouth to produce that speech at only two years old? What about chewing and swallowing? In order to have optimal chewing and swallowing, you have to be able to move the tongue side to side. So you move the food bolus to one side, chew, 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 move it to the other side, chew, 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 push the food bolus up and back. And you also need to have good tongue mobility for proper oral hygiene. You need to be able to 
clean out the back teeth, move your tongue all around. And that mobility also helps to prevent against aspiration, choking, and coughing should food get into the back of the throat. Those are some of the basic functions of tongue mobility. But more recently, we have learned that the tongue also plays an incredible role in breathing, posture, and facial development. These concepts with tongue tie are far from new. Here is a woodblock of a physician performing a phrenectomy dating in 1679, almost 400 years ago. And many of our tools and instruments are still the same today. Yet, with the advent of evidence-based medicine, where you need to have high levels of evidence before you even take a breath, there is an outcry in the dramatic rise in tongue and lip tie surgeries that are being performed without evidence, without hard science, without double-blinded, placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trials. Yet we recognize that the only intervention that you can double-blind, placebo-control are medication trials. How do you double-blind, randomize, placebo-control a patient to any surgical procedure? It really makes us think. And now with the demand that there must be proof, there must be evidence, and the only evidence that counts is level one, randomized, placebo-controlled trials, we have seen many physicians and medical professionals not advocating for treatment, saying there's no evidence. And if there's no evidence, we don't have to do anything about this problem. And so now in our clinics, we're presented with teenagers, adolescents, adults who present with untreated tongue ties. So here is a teenager with a tongue tie connected directly to the tip. And my question to you is, what kind of functions might be inhibited by this tongue tie, by this restricted tongue mobility due to the presence of connective tissue connecting the tongue to the floor of the mouth? What kind of things do you think may be affected? How about his speech? Do you guys think his speech would be affected? Is he gonna be able to lift up his tongue to produce the speech? How about chewing and swallowing? How about posture? How about sleep and breathing? Let's take a look. Welcome, thanks so much for coming to see us. You're here to see us for a tongue tie, is that right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead and just open your mouth for me. Good, and uh, try to lift up your tongue the best that you can. Okay, all right, no worries at all. So we talked about the way, the fact that your tongue tie is contributing to your speech, is that right? Yeah. Tell me about it. Like, I feel that when I speak, um, I can't alliterate as clearly as I want to. And also when I'm trying to talk quickly, I can't really speak as quick or else I get tripped up. Gotcha. And then we also talked about swallowing. Sometimes when you have a banana, you tell me about that. It's like when, when you eat like a certain type of food, you just start to gag sometimes. And it's like an awkward feeling, I guess. Totally, totally. We talked about your posture, is that right? Yeah. And then tell me when you're sleeping, what happens with your mouth? Um, when I'm sleeping, my mouth like unintentionally um, opens up when I'm sleeping and it just happens, I guess. Gotcha, I don't know. gotcha, yeah. totally, totally. And so we were talking earlier that this was identified earlier, but what did they tell you? Um, as long as he, it's not affecting his eating habits and he's able to speak, that enable the function that doesn't have to be taken care of. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, thanks for coming here and as long as I'll take care of you, okay? Thank you. Wow, as long as he's able to function, it doesn't have to be taken care of. And unfortunately, it's not just this patient who is suffering with speech swallow. Do you guys notice his posture? His shoulders rolled forward because of the effect of the fascia system the mouth falling open when he's asleep, 
It's not only this patient who's told that tongue tie doesn't affect speech or sleep. In fact, it has become well, part of the American Academy of Otolaryngology's consensus, all right? So at a recent conference, they got together a bunch of ENTs with limited experience about tongue ties, and they asked them, what do you guys think? Does tongue tie affect speech? And if I asked you guys, what would you say? Does being able to move your tongue affect speech? You would say, of course it does. Yet this group of ENTs, they went through the literature, they went through their books, and they couldn't find a double-blinded, randomized, controlled trial showing that moving the tongue is important for speech. So they concluded that tongue tie does not affect speech. There's no evidence for it. There's no randomized control trials. They've never blinded someone to these interventions. And they also emphatically stated that tongue tie has nothing to do with sleep apnea or breathing. And this is a really big missed opportunity because this is not research, okay? Getting together and forcing your opinion, forcing your thoughts is not research. Research it was about saying, I don't understand something, let me go and learn more about it. That's what research is. What they have done here in this very unfortunate consensus statement on behalf of the entire ENT community is an example of confirmation bias. They have already determined before they do this study that tongue ties are being overdone and they need to write a paper that proves that point. And by going into that project with that intention, they've already messed up their study design. They have biased themselves to not seek out objective facts, to only pick out the details that support themselves, and to ignore any information that challenges their beliefs. Rather, when we talk about research that's done through the Breathe Institute and our amazing colleagues throughout the world, what we are talking about is systematic investigation, systematically taking a look, studying in nature, among our patients, in the practice, in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. So research is about learning and discovering something new, not by just saying that no one's ever said this before, therefore it must not be possible. And to have good research, it needs to go through the specific stages of the scientific method including good methodology and study design. Because if you have a great idea and a fantastic sharp introduction section, yet you skip over the methodology, you can see that your results are less than desirable. So when we do research projects with me and my colleagues, each project takes about three to five years from inception to completion. And we do it slowly and methodologically because we want to make sure that we are overcoming the bias and that what we put out there will stand the test of time. We want to be sure that our research is free of confirmation bias, favoring information that either supports or refutes tongue tie or other interventions. We want to make sure that we're measuring the tongue ties in the same way. Some doctors are only saying it's a tongue tie if you can't stick out your tongue. Yet, based on my prior lecture that you guys have learned, we have discussed that it's not only about sticking out the tongue, it's about lifting the tongue, lifting the front of the tongue and lifting up the back of the tongue. Differences in performance bias. In our hands, these procedures are always paired with some kind of functional therapy. Yet if you're not doing the functional therapy or you're not reaching the appropriate landmarks for a complete release, you can imagine how the results may not be comparable from one group to another. And perhaps the most, it's like a stagger in my heart, is the publication bias. There are way too many journals that as soon as they see a research project supporting tongue or lip ties will say that this topic is controversial and even though you have all this amazing 
data and evidence. It's too much and it's not consistent with the views of our editors and therefore we will not accept it for publication. That's perhaps the biggest stab in the back from the journal reviewers and editors who refuse to consider the research that's being done for publication. Yet, we recognize that even though there's a consensus among ENT providers who don't have much experience in these procedures, there's also a consensus among ENT providers who do, including Dr. Gahiri, Dr. Tyler, and myself, among others who have learned with us and come and contribute to these perspectives. And so if someone says, well, hey, the American Academy published this letter saying tongue tie doesn't have anything to do with anything, you let them know that Dr. Gahiri and Dr. Zaghi and others have published a rebuttal explaining that that paper is nothing more than an opinion survey of ENT doctors who do not have adequate training or experience treating tongue ties. Rather, what we need to do is to listen to our patients, to look, feel, and observe the changes that we see before and after these interventions, recognizing that it's not only about the tongue tie surgery, but also about all the work that goes into it before and after the releases. And so here he is. You can see that immediately his shoulders open up. And as we follow him, we see improvements to speech, sleep, breathing, and yeah. more. It was it was pretty comfortable, actually. Like, the medicine, everything, it was just all cleaned and all came collected and it shot, which is really nice. Good. Go ahead, open your mouth for me and lift up your tongue. Okay. Very, very good. Now stay down for me. All right. How does your posture feel to you? It looks, or it feels a lot better. It feels like a lot cleaner. Like my shoulders are wider and broader. And instead of like hunched and scrunched, it's like more fluid and more connected with the rest of my body. Amazing. Will you turn to your side for me? Turn to your side. Yeah. Very, very, very good. Awesome. Terrific. Thanks so much for participating. Amazing. Amazing. What great results can we achieve? through clinical research by actually looking at the problem rather than shying away and saying this is hocus pocus and there's no evidence for what we're doing. How much could we achieve if more people were open-minded to the process of establishing facts and reaching new conclusions? That's what we are here to inspire you and the community to not only do, but also to really understand. So one of the biggest issues that we have is that tongue tie does not affect speech, right? They're saying it does not affect speech, yet that's not consistent with our research. And I'd love to share a case with you. Here's the case of an adorable girl with a tongue tie, severely affecting her ability to pronounce our sounds. Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, because Wednesdays, because there was an AM and PM group, um, on Wednesdays, it's everyone, and there they can't there can be too many people and um, not enough desks. Um, um, airplane, 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 ferry, 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 fair, 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 army, 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 ball, ball, star, star. Stall. Earphones. 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 Cereal. 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 Beer. Deal. Really? You just had your surgery two days ago. Let's do our... Okay. Uh, and what about ear? Ear. And ear. Ear. Wow, pretty good. Right, go ahead. The gray circle is in the top row left. The brown circle is in the middle row left. 
the red circle is in the bottom row left, the orange circle is in the top row center, the green circle is in the bottom um, middle row center, the pink circle is in the bottom row center, the yellow circle is in the top row right. Amazing, is it not? And look at what we've done for her, not only for her speech, but for her confidence and her ability to project herself in the world. Look at her posture. Do you guys note how her posture is held down and forward? And after the release, her fascia system opens up. She's standing upright. Her breathing, her speech. Wow. Wow. What have we done by opening our eyes, taking a look, and working collaboratively with, collaboratively with each other? Because the intervention delivered here is not only the tongue tie release, but also the therapy that precedes and follows the intervention. And Rebecca is an amazing therapist. And she explains that you have to not only do the release, but you have to teach them, teach them how to make the shapes and how to use the tongue to produce that speech. So if you're doing a study where you just clip, clip, oh, let's see if the speech is better, the speech isn't gonna change. And in fact, you may make things worse because the wound can reattach, creating increased scar tissue. And that's an example of performance bias. Yet, when it's done to these protocols that we have been refining over the course of the last six, seven, eight years, we see reproducible results time and time again. And it really calls into question whether these doctors who published that consensus statement recognize that you do have to be able to use your tongue to produce speech. Let's take a look at this amazing video hosted by Huberman's Lab. They do great, great work uh, making science interesting. And here's an individual, uh, an imaging of this individual having an MRI while he's speaking and breathing. And what we can see, right, even though it's just a case report and it's not double blinded or controlled or placebo, what we can see is that he's moving his tongue. He's moving the front of the tongue and the back of the tongue during the production of speaking and breathing. And the way that tongue affects breathing is that the tongue needs to go up to seal off the oral cavity in order to facilitate a breath through the nasal cavity. Wow, how much we can learn when we look at things from a different perspective. On the one hand, you can take the perspective of looking in the past at only one perspective. And if you look in that way, you will conclude that we should do nothing because it is frankly impossible. Yet, if you are open to taking a different look, a new perspective, you will recognize that we can do it because nothing is impossible when we work together for the betterment of our patients and community. And the way that we are doing this at the Breathe Institute is through the methodology of the scientific method for which each paper that we publish like this takes three to five years from the thought of it to the publication of it, where we ask a question, do our research, not only in the textbooks, but the, in the immense knowledge that exists within our community come up with the hypothesis, test that hypothesis, retest that hypothesis, confirm the hypothesis within our clinic. Then we take it to our ambassadors and our affiliate sites and see, can they reproduce our work as well? Can they give us feedback to improve our system? And then, only then do I present the information to my peers, who are all of you in the audience here today. I take your feedback and then we publish the research. It's not just having an idea and going to publish some not so exciting research article. And it's with that that we were able to publish this landmark article, Lingual Frenuloplasty with Myofunctional Therapy, which represents my experience with my first 350 cases. And you can take a look at the author list ranging from myself, Sanda, who's a dental hygienist, myofunctional therapist, Laylee, 
who is a uh, amazing partner and community member uh, and director, uh, medical students, myofunctional therapists, physical therapists, speech therapists, orthodontist, oral surgeons, and, and uh, Dr. Guillamino, who is the father of sleep medicine. And I hope that all of you guys will take the time to download and read this paper, but we also prepared a little video to summarize the most meaningful results. But the third layer, when, when he clipped them, it was like everything in my head and, and, and back opened up. And so now like you can see that the way that I hold myself is completely different. This would have been impossible before the surgery. The pressure in my jaw is gone. The pressure in the back of my head is gone. My dowager sump, which I had a really big one, gone in one second flat. Um, after the first couple uh, releases, I felt the sensation kind of go the side of my face, just kind of like a kind of like a release. And then I don't feel like I'm crunched forward anymore. I feel like I can just kind of relax now. Um, I just don't feel as tense. Um, it was really weird and I felt it actually go down my back a little bit. Um, and I feel, I feel good. My quads feel the shirt and my the shirt feels different. I don't feel the shirt, it feels like it's when we had started the procedure, my feet just sort of naturally got there, but the right one was more or less vertical, but the left one tipped out to the side. And when the first release happened, there was just kind of a wave of relaxation that went through my body. And my left leg just very naturally on its own tipped up to be parallel. And that just was sort of new, new natural. Up. Swallow. I'm going to put pressure in your mouth. Is that okay? Yeah, it feels awesome. Oh, I feel great. You feel good? It feels like something in your head. Good. Great. But I want to continue. Is that okay? Yeah. It feels like it just released all the stiffness. All the stiffness where? In my muscles and bones and body. Can you point to it where you felt the release? A little bit of here and here, uh -huh. and down on my thighs. Better? Yeah, I like something here to start with a release and a release. I feel great. My, all my muscles just come down as something everything is coming down. It's so good. Wow, 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 wow. You know, when adults say it, it's one thing, but when a child says it, it's just, it's just mind blowing. And so this is the article that we published in 2019. It's open access. So you guys should be able to download it, use the content, share it with your patients free of cost or any restrictions. Uh, and this study shows that when we do these procedures with the appropriate therapy, that's the catch with the appropriate therapy before and after, we can see improvements in not only speech, swallow, and oral hygiene, but also mouth breathing, muscle tension, snoring, and clenching. And so this is the first paper to demonstrate and indicate that, hey, tongue tie is related to mouth breathing. Tongue tie is related to muscle tension and clenching. And since that time, our results have been replicated by our colleague, Dr. Baxter, who published a similar finding that releasing these tongue ties with the appropriate therapy can improve speech, feeding, and sleep. Yet perhaps the most incredible effect of these tongue ties is on facial growth and development. We take a look at this adorable, I think, five-year-old, four or five-year-old boy with this tongue tie, I'm sure you guys would agree that this tongue is physically restricted through its connection to the mandible and the floor of mouth. And we ask, what kind of things may be affected? Do you think this is a child who's appropriately chewing and swallowing his food? 
Or is it possible that he prefers to chew on one side more than the other? Keep in mind that chewing requires you to move the tongue to sweep the food from side to side. And for optimal growth and development, you have to chew on both sides and not only in the front, but also in the back. That's why so many of our kids with tongue ties have these posterior crossfights and transverse discrepancies because of the inadequate stimulus of, that, of the chewing process. So here he is, and we do a chimera analysis. We see that he may ha be having some facial asymmetries. One side of the face is longer than the other. And when we do this chimera analysis that's available on Dr. Belfort's website, we can see that in fact, it looks like he's chewing more on his left side as compared to the right side. The left side is much more well-developed and the right side is growing long. Wow, how incredible to see that the right side of the face is growing longer. And as a consequence of this, he has to alter his head position by tilting his shoulder, holding one shoulder higher than the other. Incredible, the very concept that the whole body is connected from the tongue all the way down to the arches of the feet and the toes. And what's more meaningful is that these procedures were not performed by me myself, but rather by one of my affiliates who I uh, had the privilege of uh, attending their clinic, observing and proctoring them. And we now have, I think 20 or 30 affiliate sites throughout the country and the world where these services are being replicated and provided to the very same high standard that we expect for all of our patients. So we have learned through our research that tongue tie is certainly affecting speech. That makes sense, right? Everyone with me on that? You need to lift the tongue to produce speech. If you don't believe it, try it. Try to say some words and see, is your tongue staying still or is it moving around? The front of the tongue, the back of the tongue. And imagine what would happen if you just held your tongue down. How does that affect your speech? It's very clear and it's very obvious, even though, unfortunately, please forgive me, I don't have any randomized blinded control trials to share with you. Please forgive me. We're doing the best that we can. We can see that the tongue mobility is necessary for optimal chewing. You have to move the food side to side to clean the food from the teeth, but also sleep and breathing. I thought I would take the next few minutes to talk about what the tongue and tongue tie has to do with sleep and breathing. And so we start this discussion by recognizing that in order to breathe through the nose, two things must be true. First of all, you must have a patent nasal passage. Let's do a study here. Everybody, lock your nose, see if you can breathe. Clearly, okay, if the nose is blocked, you're not gonna be able to breathe effectively through the nose. I hope you all agree. Yet that's just one aspect of nasal breathing. The second aspect is that you need to turn that switch on and off using the tongue. When the tongue is up, you've switched nasal breathing on. The passage is open. The circuit is open from the nose to the throat in order to produce that respiration, to receive that air. Yet when the tongue is down, you've broken the circuit and the air is gonna come out of the mouth. Indeed, the only way to breathe through the mouth, the only way that anybody can breathe through the mouth is with the tongue down. Try it yourself, okay? Try to keep your tongue high in the palate and you will see that you have turned nasal breathing on. It is impossible, strictly impossible in 100% of patients in all parts of the world to breathe through your mouth with the tongue up. It is impossible. Show me one patient who can do it and I'll show you that they're not getting their tongue up effectively. Rather, in order to breathe through the mouth, the tongue must be down. There's no other way. Now the question becomes, if you have a tongue tie, if you have a tongue tie, is the tongue being held down or up? 
And it's clear to see that in some cases of tongue tie, not all cases, but in some cases of tongue tie, the tongue is held down in such a fashion that it makes it difficult to lift up the back of the tongue. And we call these restrictions in not only anterior tongue mobility, but perhaps more importantly, posterior tongue mobility. And as we discuss, posterior tongue mobility doesn't refer to the back, back, back of the tongue. It refers to the posterior aspect of the anterior two thirds of the tongue. So posterior tongue mobility is really middle tongue mobility. And we can see here that this patient with a tongue tie has difficulty with this middle part of the tongue, the posterior part of the tongue, of the anterior two thirds of the tongue, such that when he tries to lift his tongue up, it requires a lot of increased effort. So now this individual requires increased effort to breathe through the nose and is gonna default to mouth breathing when his system is under high tension. Does that make sense to you guys? So pop quiz, pop quiz, is this child with the naturally optimal tongue position high in the mouth, breathing through the nose or breathing through the mouth? Is this child breathing through the nose? This child is breathing through the nose. How about this patient with a tongue tie? that's tethering the tongue low in the mouth. Is this child going to be mouth breathing or nose breathing? And we can see that this child's gonna be mouth breathing. And you kind of can start to understand now that when the tongue is affected in this way, it's not only the mouth breathing, not only the posture, but chewing, swallowing, facial development. So let us learn here now that the tongue functions as an on off switch for nasal breathing. The tongue functions as an on off switch for nasal breathing. How simple yet complex, amazing, beautiful. What we are saying is that when the tongue is high, you've switched on the nasal breathing circuit. When the tongue is down, you switched off the nasal breathing circuit yet of course, there are other factors that are also involved. For example, you need to have enough room in the mouth for the tongue, for the tongue to adequately fit in the palate. If you have a tongue tie, the tongue is held down. If you have low tone, the tongue is held down. Yet also, if you don't have enough space in the mouth, the tongue cannot make a complete seal to facilitate that nasal breathing. And you want the tongue fully in the roof of the mouth to create that negative suction cup effect that's discussed in this article here that supports the tongue high in the roof of the mouth. Here is a child who was treated for tongue tie and we're doing the sleeping tongue posture hold. We can see that the tongue is up. How amazing, the tongue is up and you're looking at the ventral surface of the tongue. And so if the tongue is up with that beautiful seal, that negative suction cup effect, my question to you is, is this child nose breathing or mouth breathing with the tongue up? And we recognize that when the tongue is up, we switch nasal breathing on and this child is nasal breathing. How beautiful, how amazing. These concepts are far from new. This article was published in 2011. Wow, wow. The truth of the matter is, is that there are a lot of studies. It's just that they're not randomized and they're not double-blinded or placebo-controlled, okay? And here is another article that shows the similar concepts that many, it's most ideal to have the tongue with complete mobility free to get to the roof of the mouth. There are cases where the tongue is firmly held down, yet, the majority of cases are somewhere in the middle, okay? So you have the black and white where the tongue is like perfect and you have the ones that are really tethered and there's this group in the middle where you're not sure. Sometimes it's nose breathing, sometimes it's mouth breathing, sometimes it's affected and it's these more mild cases that requires extra attention and study and deliberation for optimal 
uh, results and guidance, okay? So we recognize that it's not always so crystal clear. And in these cases where the tongue is being held down a little bit, you may not get the same severity of issues as you would in a case like this, yet it still may affect some mild R sounds, S sounds, posture, neck and shoulder tension that you wouldn't have otherwise experienced with optimal tongue mobility. How lucky am I that Maxim was able to get his tongue tie released? Because not all patients have this uh, good fortune and insight to be able to do that. And there are too many uh, pediatricians, doctors, community members out there who are advocating against these interventions. And when we don't do the proper, uh, achieve the proper tongue mobility and posture, this affects chewing, swallowing, teeth development, jaw development, airway, breathing, and sleep. Then these kids present with ADHD issues, attention, behavior, upper airway resistance syndrome, and more. We are here to emphasize the importance of identifying the smoke before it becomes a fire. Here is a, a newborn with low tongue posture, not due to tongue tie, but due to torticollis. Torticollis is a condition of muscle spasm, the sternocleidomastoid. It pulls on the extraoral fascia that pulls on the intraoral fascia and causes the tongue to come down. This child with the fascial restriction will present with many of the symptoms similar to a tongue tie, including mouth breathing due to that low tongue posture. Yet we recognize that tongue tie is only one cause of low tongue posture. And in this case, the low tongue posture started as a fascial restriction. And the mouth breathing perpetuates, causes changes in facial growth and development, tonsil hypertrophy, adenoid, turbinate hypertrophy, uh, that results in problems with sleep disorder breathing. Yet, when you do the sleep study, she's sleeping on her face. She's sleeping with her face down. And this is going to help her avoid the obstruction. Yet what is this kind of sleeping posture going to do to her facial growth and development? Could you surmise that maybe her nose isn't going to go straight if she's sleeping on her face? Maybe she's guiding her nose to develop a deviation that will further affect her growth and development. So we have to kind of recognize that uh, we have to find the root cause. And the root cause is sometimes tongue tie and most often something else. Tongue tie only accounts for about seven to 10% of the problem. And if we're training you guys to go out there and screen all of these kids and you guys are identifying tongue ties in every single patient that comes to your clinic, and that's the only thing that you're identifying, and you're missing problems with low tone, muscle tension, high arch palate, diet, nutrition, chewing, and swallowing, you have to recognize that it's not only a missed diagnosis, but as Dr. Pinto says, a misdiagnosis. We have to recognize that tongue tie plays a role, but tongue tie is only one piece of the puzzle, okay? Yes, we want to have optimal oral function. We want to have good sleep and breathing. And good sleep and breathing starts with nasal breathing because mouth breathing and noisy breathing and snoring, according to the latest research, makes changes in the cortical gray matter and perpetuates the onset of behavioral issues and further problems with sleep disorder breathing. Dr. Guillamino recognized that mouth breathing leads to local inflammation, which leads to tonsillar enlargement, adenoid enlargement, turbinate hypertrophy, which worsens the nasal breathing. And this leads to systemic inflammation, posture malaltation, and abnormal facial growth that perpetuates the mouth breathing. Our group has since learned that it's not only mouth breathing, but really the low tongue posture that underlies the abnormal oral facial growth. And we recognize that tongue tie is only one cause of low tongue posture. We really need to be looking at the entire scope and field of oral myofascial dysfunction. We want the tongue to rest high in the roof of the mouth to maintain optimal airway function. 
When the tongue is low, it'll block the airway. Blocks the airway, leads to problems with mouth breathing, sleep disturbances, and altered maxillary growth. We want the tongue to sit high to grow the upper jaw. When the tongue sits high, it works most optimally as a natural palate expander for the maxillary arch, not only on the direct forces of the tongue, but also on the chewing and the swallowing. Yet if your patient isn't chewing or swallowing, either because of a tongue tie or because of other issues, such as the diet and nutrition that we provide them or the habits that we teach them, these kids will develop V-shaped, high arch, narrow palates with not enough room in the mouth for the teeth or the tongue. And all too often, there's a misdiagnosis here where the orthodontist will recognize that, hey, there's not enough room in the mouth for all the teeth. So they pull the teeth out, the premolars out, and make all the teeth fit within this high arch, narrow palate. Rather, we would propose that perhaps making more room in the mouth with a palate expander or other mechanisms would not only allow you to have enough room in the mouth for all the teeth, but also to have enough room in the mouth for the tongue. And you need to have good room in the mouth for the tongue for that optimal oral function. If the tongue is squeezed in a tight cage, it's similarly going to affect speech, chewing, and swallowing, among other issues that we see in patients with uh, oral dysfunction. When the tongue sits low, the face grows long because of the impact of the tongue on development of the upper jaw. And we recognize that the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. So when the roof of the mouth is narrow, you get a narrow nasal cavity. When you have this narrow nasal cavity, you can get buckling of the septum that further produces deviations and altered airflow, hypertrophy of the turbinates due to because of mouth breathing, but also because of increased turbulence to airflow that results in worsening nasal breathing. Yet we also recognize that the top of the maxilla is the floor of the orbit, orbit and these patients can also have you know, deficiencies in the uh, orbital support. We have shown that in fact, tongue tie is related to the development of a V-shaped maxillary arch, but our research in and of itself shows that tongue tie is only about 7.6% of the problem. Yes, it's important to identify and address these tongue ties, but we also have to recognize that tongue tie is only one aspect of the problem. Tongue tie is only one aspect of the problem. And if you're really gonna be doing this to help your patients, then you must, it is imperative upon you to not only look for the tongue tie, but also to look at tongue posture, chewing, swallowing, diet, mouth breathing, habits, genetic factors, and more. If you're just assessing based on a single picture that there's a tongue tie and that's all you need to do, you're missing 90% of the problem because 90% of the problem is not the tongue tie, but the way our children are being fed, the diets that they're being consumed and how they're being taught to feed. When I was a dad, if you asked me, what would you feed your baby? I would tell you, you feed them baby food. You go to the grocery store, you get baby food and you spoon it into them like that Gerber baby with the mouth open posture. Rather, we learn about baby led weaning and the way that we're supposed to most ideally help our children develop a healthy relationship with food. When they feed themselves and the way that you feed, as Anna Gross will convey to you, makes a big difference in the tongue mechanics. If you get the spoon and you shove it in there, it promotes a tongue thrust. Rather, as I've learned from Anna, and I hope that you guys will learn as well, when you put the food on the lips, you encourage them to get their lips together and then push the tongue up to swallow. Wow. Oh my gosh. You're saying that the way that we feed our kid is going to affect growth and development? And the answer is yes. And the way that you feed your kid is more important than if there's a tongue tie or not. The tongue tie is only relevant in so much as how it affects the chewing and swallowing, which of course it will, because how are you gonna get your lips together and get that tongue up in the setting of tongue and lip ties? These kids will develop compensations. So we really have to recognize 
uh, the big role. And even if you do your best, it's also common that kids can develop bad habits. You go to you know, the children's museum or water parks or things like that, you're looking for food for your kids. And what do they have? The kids menu is all mush. It's all soft foods, mac and cheese, chicken nuggets, fries, foods that they can just slurp down rather than really chew and swallow. And so it's all too often that they can learn bad habits. And here is Maxim learning these habits of chewing and swallowing from our family dog. So adorable. Yeah, <laughs> we have to get Maxim back on track. He is so proud of himself. Adorable. And so we encourage him and expose him to different consistencies of food. Here he is eating whole pieces of steak. Amazing, 14 month eating steak, unbelievable. And really it's this chewing, not only on the front, but on the back that's helping to develop good facial growth and symmetry. How amazing is this, right? So keep in mind, not only the nutritional factors that comes from real whole food, but also how you're eating that food and your relationship with food as nutrition that plays such a huge role in oral function growth and development. So let us recognize that tongue tie is a very important central component and part of this mission for early intervention. Yet tongue tie is also only one factor. That's why I congratulate all of you here in this course for coming to be exposed to the whole community of different things that we can do from cranial strains, fascia restrictions, diet, nutrition, feeding, breathing, palate growth and development so that we can really take care of the patients in our communities. Because if we miss these problems, we can have our patients enter the cycle of dysfunction that underlies the root cause of sleep and breathing disorders. So my question to you is, is it important to assess for tongue tie with early intervention? After this one hour lecture here so far, is it important to look for tongue ties? And the question I hope is completely sealed and answered that the answer is a resounding yes, absolutely. Tongue tie plays a role. Tongue mobility plays a role in speech, chewing, oral hygiene, facial development, breathing, posture, and more. But is tongue tie the only thing we should be looking for? Should we just do these releases and send them off in the world and say, good luck, see you later? No, no. What a missed opportunity. What a missed diagnosis when the only thing we're looking for is tongue ties. We need to get these patients back, keep them on track, keep them on track. And you guys are the quarterbacks. You guys should be aware of all these different elements of the puzzle and send the patient to the appropriate person one at a time. It's not going to be possible to treat all of these issues all together. They need one person in the middle, which is often a functional pediatric dentist who is aware of all the different pieces of the puzzle and will understand how these pieces of puzzle work together provide that education to the parent, stay on top of it and target one issue and then move on to the next. If you make a whole host of issues and throw all of these puzzle pieces to the parents, you're gonna overwhelm them. And when you overwhelm them, you've missed your chance to parachute them out of this cycle of oral dysfunction. So what else are we looking for? And this applies to kids three and up, okay? We're going to be, this is called the Ferris Six. It's now in the Journal of Pediatric Dentistry. And it's six factors that we have identified and published over the course of five years, including support by Dr. Christian Guillaumino himself and Audrey Yoon and other amazing Cynthia Peterson and other amazing co-faculty. Six things that we look for in our kids three and up. And we're here to kind of give you a commitment that we are actively working through our Breathe Babies and Kids department to come up with screening 
for three months, six months, 12 months, a year and a half, two years, two and a half, three years. What should we be looking for to keep these kids on track for good facial growth, health, breathing, and development? Because breathing is the beginning and breathing starts at the beginning. In the Ferris Six, we have identified six risk factors for sleep disorder breathing. And as you have each of these risk factors, the risk of having a problem increases. The first factor that we identify is nose versus mouth breathing. We want to be breathing through our nose 96% of the time. We look for signs of mentalis strain, which is an indication of vertical facial growth, deficient maxilla, retronathia, oral incompetence. We look for problems with tonsil hypertrophy, tongue tie, of course, not only the front of the tongue, but the back of the tongue through the lingual palatal suction. We look for signs of dental wear and the narrow palate. And how amazing that this is now part of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry guidelines to be looking at all of these six factors, including tongue ties, but not only tongue ties. In adults with sleep disorder breathing, we do further evaluation in the form of sleep studies and CT scans. Yet in children, these sleep studies are not reliable. The sleep studies are looking for obstructive sleep apnea. So by the time you have the problem, it's almost too late. And which child is going to go into a sleep lab, be hooked to all these wires and sleep normally? These studies, even with insurance, can cost two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 after a two to six month wait. Rather, we advocate for questionnaires like this one out of the book, Sleep Wrecked Kids, where you ask the parents to become more vigilant. And just as you would be concerned if this mother marked all yeses, you should be more concerned. You should be more concerned for the child that presents with open mouth posture, uh, you know, lack of orbital rim support, vertical growth, low tone, where the mom reports all no's. Okay, that's even more concerning when the mom doesn't even know because they're 100 feet away while the kid is sleeping. So what we encourage our parents to do is to get a video camera sleep screening of the child sleeping. And we assess it based on the research of Dr. Guillen, you know, who indicated that the majority of sleep disorder breathing in children is non-hypoxic. That means that these kids are struggling to breathe without having sleep apnea. This is what sleep apnea looks like. You see this girl here, high arch, narrow palate. She takes a breath. And then let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Breathe, little girl. Oh my goodness. What if I could tell you that this didn't show up all of a sudden? This girl didn't develop a high arch, narrow palate, low tone, setback jaws overnight. This has been creeping up. And it all started with myofunctional issues, mouth breathing, nasal congestion that we have to stay on top of all throughout their lives. You have a kid like this with some nasal congestion, you can clear them up with x lear sprays, not nasal hygiene, some myofunctional therapy, and within a week, beautiful, beautiful. Let us understand the impact of a compromised airway on all these different dimensions. Let us recognize that breathing is the beginning and the beginning starts at birth. And let us celebrate, let us celebrate the role of our team to not only address tongue ties, but the whole complexity of these issues that affect our kids. Because these children, who are born with issues that affect their breathing, whether it's allergies, 
resulting in nasal congestion, tonsil hypertrophy, whether it's just habits that change the shape of their face, or if they're born with a deviated septum, like this adorable boy who's never breathed through his nose since birth because of a terrible deviated septum that I corrected at around you know, 10, 11 years of age, stimulating to undergo puberty within just a few months because of the release of growth hormone. Let's identify these issues early on. Let's learn to identify and treat these sources of nasal obstructions even among our babies. We want our children to be breathing through their nose 96% of the time. 96% of the time, we want to be breathing through the nose, lip seal, tongue up. This is based on the research of Dr. Guillermo himself, who indicated that mouth breathing for more than 10% of sleep time is considered pathologic. So if they're having open mouth posture five to 15% of the time, we classify that as mild mouth breathing, more than 15 is moderate, and more than 35% of the time as severe mouth breathing. So what can you do in these babies who are being born with nasal obstruction? The first thing to consider that is considered in the hospital is real structural problems, such as problems with coenal atresia. Coenal atresia is a condition in which is a bone blocking the nasal passage. And if you're physically obstructed in the nose, the presentation is devastating. It affects their ability to feed, it causes failure to thrive, and it's very, very obvious and clear. They can have problems with cleft lip and palate that also affects nasal breathing, and these are usually well addressed and well identified by the medical community. What's often missed is sometimes deviations of the nasal septum that arise out of the birth canal. And these things are so easy to correct. You just get a little steri strip or a kinesio tape and the cartilage is so soft that it's easily moldable. How amazing, what an impact we've made on this child's growth and development. And it turns out that it's also possible, as Dr. Nora will show you shortly, to widen the palate with intraoral massages. Wow, what if this child presented with breastfeeding issues and you didn't realize there was a deviated septum? and all you did is you released the tongue tie. It's all about tongue tie, right? Let's just release the tongue tie. Let's just release the tongue tie. You've missed the bigger picture. So this was taped for about a week, and that was a mild case that may have been missed. Here's a severe case. Oh my goodness, okay? And within a week, you have changed the life of this baby. Wow, okay? Yet I'll tell you that even this is particularly rare. The most common cause of nasal obstruction in infants is allergies due to milk protein or food that the mother is eating and gets into the breast milk. And for this extent, the best thing that you can do is to just rinse the nose with some saline drops, okay? One ml of saline and to suction it out. If you're looking to get someone a baby shower guest, please get them this. Nasal saline drops and an aspirator. Amazing, amazing, okay? Uh, allergies, it's primarily food allergies early on in life. Environmental allergies start to develop around three, four, five, six years of age. In terms of food allergies, there are great products like the Ready, Set, Feed food, which exposes the children to the top allergens and helps them, uh, you know, desensitize off of them. So I hope that you guys recognize that in a functional approach to sleep and breathing, we want all patients to breathe well, sleep well, and function well. We want to optimize health and wellness for all patients through prevention, early identification, management, and definitive resolution. And with so many children in the United States the United and in the States, world, there are 74 million children. Let me fix this. 74 million children, I, I got to fix that slide here. Uh, there are 74 million children, yet there are not enough pediatric dentists, 
or even general dent or, or even ENTs to take care of these problems. We really need everyone on the ground to address these issues, looking at not only tongue tie, but also tongue tone and tongue space, understanding the role of a functional approach to growth and development, looking at, yes, of course, tongue tie, but more. We need to be looking at breathing, feeding, sleeping, oral habits, food and environment, fascia, body posture, and more. That is why I'm so proud of our Breathe Babies and Kids department and why I am so proud of all of you guys here to identify the smoke before the fire. I know this lecture was really fast, but I also hope you can see my passion in delivering this information and this content. We will make this publicly available via YouTube if you guys enjoyed the lecture so that it can be made available to your patients and families so they can really understand the investment that you are making in your education to learn more. And I encourage you guys to come back and continue learning with us. <clears throat> I offer a four-day in-person and five-day online course that I would highly, highly, highly recommend to you guys. If you guys are able to make it, uh, the team will let you know about our course dates because the mind, once stretched by a new idea, never returns to its original dimensions. And I hope that all of you, whether you're here in person or watching this on YouTube, will join us in bringing better breathing to your communities. Thank you guys so, so much. Greatly, greatly appreciate your time, attention, energy, contributions, and for allowing me to be part of this incredible mission. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Dr. Nora Gadisi Zaghi, and today I'm going to talk to you all about the foundations of function, optimizing growth and development. I am a board certified pediatric dentist and I've continued training in my areas of interest. This includes sleep, breathing, interceptive orthodontics, oral motor feeding, and I am a Myo Masterminds graduate in which I have advanced knowledge in myofunctional therapy. I'm also a faculty and speaker for the Myo Functional Research Company, and my favorite role is being the Pediatric Dental Director of Breathe Institute and providing care for my department under Breathe Kids Dental, where I provide whole body focused dental care with a special interest in growth guidance and sleep and breathing. I'm also a mom of a two-year-old tongue-tie graduate, Maxim, and I work in a space where I'm grateful to be able to provide ongoing care for patients that have previously had releases. My husband, Dr. Suresh Kuzagi, has a one, been a wonderful resource in which I'm able to provide multidisciplinary care in this collaborative space. Um, I saw firsthand how important it was with Maxim to have a village by your side and utilizing services myself for, from ENT, PT, OT, SLP, lactation consulting. These are all important resources to have to be able to help a child advance and grow. And I feel fortunate that we're able to provide these services for our patients. Today's discussion will include functional whole health growth development assessments and airway centric modifications and growth and development between zero and five. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what is a high arch palate. Well, the tongue develops in utero about four weeks and the palate develops between five to 12 weeks in utero. Swallowing develops between 10 to 12 weeks in utero. So the high and narrow palate can be a direct effect of these tongue ties, and it can affect feeding, breathing, craniofacial development, because the tongue is the driving force of the premaxilla and form follows function. But I also want practitioners to be aware of what syndromes may be associated with this and may also cause some of those symptoms associated with tongue ties. And this can include cruzons, downs, aperts, Treacher Collins, Marfans, and Inconscious Pigmente. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the indications for developing these arches and how we can go about doing so. This is a photo of a child with a high arch narrow palate. I just wanted us to have an image in our minds of what we're imagining when we may see a newborn with these high arch narrow palates. 
Here are some very interesting edentulous impressions. Um, you'll see the progression of shallow to deep palatal vaults. And I want you to note the prominence of the palatal rugae, the internal rotations of the maxillae, and the asymmetries in the palate that further develop as the palate continues to be more high and narrow as you go from left to right in these images. I also wanted you to have access to some of the research studies. And this is a study just looking at palatal shelf length, palatal, sh palatal shelf width, arch height, arch, ang arch uh, angles, and it's in mice. And it just furthers reviews about how palates can vary and the process is evolved. And you can go ahead and use this QR code to go and read the study yourselves. Here's another study on hard palate and high arch palate development. And what we're seeing is that crowding of incisors and canines, malocclusion, malalignment, absence of second premolars and spacing between teeth were observed in a high arch palatal group. And now we know that this is linked to sleep and breathing issues. And this is a reason now more than ever to intervene early. So a question I often get asked is, what's our scope of practice? Can we, can we intervene early? Is it recommended? And actually, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry's latest revision in 2021 shows that if we see an issue, that developing malocclusion, adverse growth and development, interventions can be recommended if a diagnosis is made, treatment's appropriate and possible, and patients are supportive and desire to have the treatment done. So yes, it's very much so in our scope of practice to intervene and treat early. And what does that look like? Well, together with your village, you can optimize tongue space and jaw development, no matter the age. And this can include oral massages of the palate on an early age, baby munchie or other appliances, teething tools such as tri chews, chewy tubes or fluxies, and these encourages safe mouthing experiences as there's different textures and extensions that prepare for feeding and the hardness of these teethers also encourage the elevation of the tongue to the palate which increases jaw strength and further develops the palate as well and why does this matter what does this have to do with breathing well the floor of the nose is the roof of the mouth so if our upper jaw is small, that means the nasal passages are also underdeveloped. This directly impacts breathing. So when you see dental crowding, high arch narrow palates, these are signs, these are red flags that the bones are small, secondary to an airway and tongue issue. And this can lead to sleep disordered breathing. Functional pediatric dentists are at the forefront to be able to examine the root cause to help us sleep and breathe better early on. And now we have studies that show this. So this is a study that was uh, published quite recently by Audrey Yoon, Rebecca Vakow, and Moore, and Dr. Dr. Stanley Liu. And you can scan the QR code and read this study, but it's showing how children with uh, enlarged tonsils can significantly reduce the size of the adenoid tissue and palatine tonsils after palatal expansion treatment. And this, this is a study that's actually quantified how this, the structures have decreased as they shifted from mouth breathing to nasal breathing from this rapid palatal expansion. It's incredible being able to not have to do surgery by having appliance treatment instead. Treatment options can vary for underdeveloped jaws under five years old. So it can be options such as oral motor and feeding therapy, myofunctional therapy, and this can correct malocclusions alone alongside release if necessitated. And there's also functional appliances such as Myobrace, Myo Munchie, Healthy Start, and also removable or fixed expanders and Invisalign first. Well, these are appliances that are created to help simulate the pre-industrialization diets of hard whole foods that encourage chewing muscles to eat and swallow, which previously aided in arch development. Now children are grown and being born with much smaller jaws. 
And what we see is that these appliances may be helpful in developing their arches. So it could be something like Healthy Start. And for children between two to four, it can help with habit correction and maybe roaring during sleep. It also helps with that arch development. There's also tools like Baby Munchie or Mini Munchie. And this is with guided practitioner use from anywhere from six to 18 months to improve oral tone function, strengthen the muscles of the lips, face, and tongue. It also helps in protecting you from developing caries by increased saliva production and help proper swallowing training. So we also have other appliances like the MyoChew, an infant trainer, which also helps with the jaw strength development and nasal breathing. And this tool has a wonderful tongue tab, which helps remind the patient to elevate the tongue and bring it up to the roof of the mouth. Because as we know, the tongue is the driving force of the premaxilla and helps aid in that growth and development of the jaw. And with the tongue staying up on the roof of the mouth, we're going to be able to get that growth that we want and need. There are also options like removable or fixed expanders. And this is a, um, a photo by Gavin James and Dennis Strogton about what the different expansion methods can be. They can be orthopedic, they can have expansion screws, they can aid in arch development, it can use uh, arch wires and more. There's also other types of expanders such as Crozats, Schwartz, Frankel appliances, and it's all indicative about what you see in your child in the child that's presenting and what exact expansion or jaw correction or uh, occlusion changes that they need. So I wanted to offer a comparative look at appliances. There's so many tools that we can use and so many that we need in our toolbox. This can include ALF appliances, which is an advanced light wire functional appliances. There's also bonded rapid palatal expanders, which you can see here, and those can be bonded onto the teeth. There's also rapid palate expanders that are banded, where it uses cement to band onto the teeth. There's also Crozats appliances that have light wire, function, uh, light wire movements as well. There's also Schwartz appliances that are, can be removable or fixed. And there's also removable anterior growth guidance appliances, which also help in um, jaw growth and development as well. Now there's really interesting other tools that we can use, and this can include Invisalign First. So Invisalign per First is a wonderful tool that practitioners use in, and can be used in the primary dentition to improve expansion, to, uh, ch to help with cross bites. And also this is a wonderful uh, appliance because it also has decreased incidence in child bullying. It increases child's confidence. They have stickers for the liners with emojis to make it exciting. And that also increases the compliance as well. So here you can see in these images that we have primary spacing that's quite small between these primary interior teeth. And in the final, uh, in the final image, what we see, this is an after where the primary dentition, you can see that there's improved spacing in the primary spaces, which aids in the erupting dentition, the erupting permanent teeth that are going to take place of these, these primary teeth. Here you can see that the arched growth and development not only is um, in the posterior segment, but also in the anterior segment, like I said, to aid in the erupting permanent dentition and also help with jaw relationship as well. So like I mentioned, I've personally learned that when it comes to expansion and growth guidance, there's so many different routes that you can take and the various indications for those routes based on behavior, skeletal presentation, and habits. So this is our course that we're going to be putting um, out soon, and it's put together with practitioners in mind that want to learn and understand the very many different appliances and why an individual would gravitate towards an ALF or Zanaraga and for example, and the protocols involved. We're very excited. We know that we're going to reach and help so many children. And those of you that are just beginning releases in infants and children will now see how crucial arch development thereafter release is and we want to be able to give you all that confidence to go out there and help the children in your communities. I want to thank you all for your time. These are my social media handles. And also this is my uh, personal email, drnora at thebreatheinstitute.com. I hope you enjoyed being here with us today and I look forward to hearing from you all soon. Thank you and take care and I appreciate learning with all of you.